The Jordan Curve Theorem is one of those statements in math that seems completely obvious and yet requires actually quite a bit of work to prove it. Now I stated it last time, uh, but I'll state it again today, and by the end of this lecture you'll be able to see at least a version of a proof of uh, a variation of the standard Jordan Curve Theorem, and it's the one that I'm going to call the Polygonal Jordan Curve Theorem. So we've uh, Limiting, we're limiting ourselves just to polygons here, and if you recall, this statement it is something like, I'll put it in quotes first before I give you the uh, real statement on the next piece of paper. It says that if you have a simple closed curve, it has an inside and an outside. Simple just means it doesn't self-intersect. Closed means it comes back like a loop, so it's a polygon. So if you have a polygon, uh, it has an inside and an outside which sounds pretty obvious. Um, but those two, not only does it have those two parts, those two faces, but they're disconnected. That is, you can't get from the inside to the outside without passing through it. So every polygon has an inside and an outside, and those are the only two sides. Now, um, Again, this is, this is the kind of obvious where if you give it to an elementary school student, you ask them if it's true or not, uh, they'll say, yes, that's true. And they will say it with great confidence, and they'll be right, but they won't necessarily be able to give a real good argument for why. Um, and I'll just ask this right here and, and let you think about this for a second. Is it really obvious? Um, and if you think it is, well, I mean, in, you can ask, well, what if we were talking about a polygon in 3D? If I embed a cycle in 3D, there's no, probably, just one connected component, I think. And uh, there's no notion of inside or outside at that point. You can also imagine some other weirder uh, places to embed a cycle, to have a polygon. And again, you may not really be able to um, clearly define what is inside and what's outside. We'll see at least one example before we go. All right. So um, let's give the, the real statement here. So this is our polygonal Jordan curve theorem. Oh, I forgot to write it again, so let me just put it in there. The polygonal Jordan curve theorem. So for any polygon P uh, in R2, remember P, the polygon here is going to be, uh, you can think of it as the embedding of a cycle, a piecewise linear embedding of a cycle, or really just a linear embedding of a cycle graph. And so there, the claim is that there are exactly two path-connected components of, um, well, of what? This is the plane uh, minus the polygon. So again, you should think of this as I took out a big pair of scissors and I cut along the edges of the polygon, and what I had left were some pieces of the plane, and how many pieces do I have? Well, if it was a polygon, I have two of them inside and outside. And actually, it's, the outside is well-defined because only one of them is unbounded. I'll just write that as a, another part of this. All right. Now, um, in terms of graph embeddings, explicitly, this is like saying, if I took a, a cycle graph, CK, I take its embedding, right? So this is like the image of an embedding of the cycle in the plane, um, that this has two faces. And I may use this notation a bit just for short so I don't have to write, for instance, uh, the embedding of the geometric realization of the graph. Right? So it has two faces. And this is true for um, any uh, piecewise linear embedding of CK. All right, so let's jump into it. Um, in order to prove this, we are going to depend on some facts um, that really come from geometry. So we're going to use some ideas of geometry um, to make the topology easier. And that's why we're really working with this simplified piecewise linear or polygonal version. Um, and the idea is that if you just had a line segment and you take a point on a line segment and you look in a small circle around that point, the line segment passes through this small circle, and here you can prove just geometrically that there are two sides. Like if I take the circle and the line, right, there's one side of the line and the other side of the line. And more generally, if you have a polygonal path like this, then um, you can cover that path 
with these small neighborhoods, these little circles, and within each circle, including around the vertices, um, the path enters and it leaves, and within the circle, the path cuts it into two pieces. And moreover, um, if you have only a finite number of line segments, then you can actually uh, find a smallest radius that you need so that every, every point on the curve has a ball of that radius and those radii um, or those circles uh, only touch the curve in this nice clean way where it enters and leaves in just two parts. And the reason this is useful, you'll see this red path here, is that you can, you can walk uh, along the edges. So if you have two adjacent ones of these circles, they overlap uh, nicely so that you can continue your path. And so if I get close to an edge, I can walk along the edge. And that's going to be the key to most of these proofs is that we're going to kind of look at paths and we, when we hit up into an edge, we can continue and walk along that edge, staying on one side. So why is that useful? Well, um, in this case, for instance, here are two points inside a polygon. And if we walk in any direction until we hit the edge, we can kind of walk along the edge of the polygon until we get to a point where we can just go straight to Y. So, so remember, if we're going to reason about the path-connected components here, then we actually want to find paths between points, points that are both either both inside or both outside. Now, in this case, um, this wouldn't have worked if we somehow, as we came around, we ended up on the wrong side of this edge. That is, if we ended up over here and not on the other side. And... Um, if we had some object other than a polygon, this can totally happen. For instance, here's a, an arbitrary graph, um, and you'll notice as you walk along the, the edge here, you end up on the other side. Um, similarly, if, the, if this path, even this, if it was a polygon, but it was embedded on a Mobius strip, um, then as you go walk along one side on the Mobius strip, you've probably seen this before, you end up on the other side. Um, Actually, we end up on the whole other side of the, of the paper here, but um, in terms of being right next to the edge in the surface, um, you, you, it looks like you've crossed over the, the edge, right? So it's like you've got from inside to outside without actually um, crossing the edge. So in this case, you know, this is not a cycle, and this is not a plane, or it's not in the plane. So here, I'm just checking the hypotheses, right? We have these hypotheses that you have a cycle, embedded cycle, that is a polygon, and it's embedded in the plane. We want to be able to do this kind of walking along the edges, and I'm just showing you that if you didn't have a cycle or if it was not in the plane, this might not work. Okay. All right. So now, to start, we're going to look at points in the plane minus the polygon, right? So I can't walk on the black uh, line here, which is the boundary of the polygon. Um, but I have this point x, and I'm going to define this function over here. This is j of x r, where r is some ray, right? So it's a like a line, a half line that goes off in this direction. And this is going to be the number of times that this ray crosses the polygon. Right? So it's the crossings of the polygon with the ray. Um, the ray R, and, um, but I'm going to take it modulo 2, right? So it's either 0 or 1 it's, if it's even or odd number of crossings. So in this case, as I go out, I've got 1, 2, 3. That's an odd number of crossings. So J of X R is 1. Okay. Now, uh, once I have this, I can make the following little observation, um, which is that as I rotate the ray, unless I pass through a vertex, this number of crossings doesn't change. And when I pass through a vertex, I realize I have to be careful about how I count crossings. Because uh, is this a crossing or not? And we're going to say, for instance, that this one is not a crossing. This one is a crossing. 
this one is a crossing. If it came onto the array, came over and then came back, we would say it's not a crossing. And if it comes up to and back like this, that's also not a crossing. Okay, it actually has to be um, a part of the polygon that starts on one side, hits the array, and then continues onto the other side. All right, so now as we rotate this ray, so I started here and then I rotated up to say here, you'll notice that I had zero and now I have two crossings, right? So I have two new crossings right here. Right here I had one crossing and I still have just one crossing. So the change is zero. Here I had one crossing and I still only have one crossing, change is zero. Here, um, if I went back just a little bit, I had zero, I still have zero, but if I went back just a little bit, I had two crossings right before this vertex, and so as I pass through it, I go to zero, so it goes minus two. Now the moral of this story is that as you rotate, anytime there's a change locally, that change is either plus two, minus two, or zero. It's not much of a change at all. Uh, in terms of the number of crossings mod two, it doesn't change. So it really didn't matter what direction I shot the ray in, I'm going to get the same value. So um, for any pair R, R prime of rays, JXR is equal to JX, R prime. So it makes sense for us to kind of overload this notation and just say that there's J of X. Now, something cool happened. We now have a function for any point in the plane minus the polygon. I take this function, it gives me zero or one. Well, it's going to turn out that if it's zero, that's going to be outside the polygon, and one is going to be inside. So I wanted to claim that there are two components, and now I've actually found them just from this function. And in fact, this is even computationally how you might test if a point is inside an arbitrary polygon, is to shoot a ray and see how many edges it crosses over. Like I said, j of x equals one, we're going to call that inside, and if j of x is equal to zero, that's outside. Okay, and now what we want to prove is that uh, j of x is equal to j of y, that is, they're on the same side, if and only if x and y are path connected. I almost fit that in the box. Alright. So, first step. Because there's two directions, it's an if and only if statement. First, we're going to show that if they're actually path connected, then they have the same value, right? J of x is going to be equal to j of y. And if they're path connected, then there is a path. And again, all the paths we're talking about here are polygonal paths. So we can do induction on the number of segments in the path. All right, so the base of the induction is if there's a, a path of length or a, a straight line segment from x to y, then j of x equals j of y. And uh, that's clearly true because if I look at the ray from x to x prime, if I look at just this one ray, if this first part of it is entirely inside the, or outside the polygon, as it doesn't cross the polygon, then the num j of x has to be equal to j of x prime, right? The number of crossings with this ray, there aren't any crossings here, so all the crossings have to be in the part that they share. That's for a, a path, a line segment of length one, that is a path with a single line segment. And so we get that j of x here is equal to, I can write it out with, uh, remembering that we have this, these rays, and if you think of the ray now really as just a vector and we're looking at all the points in that direction, this is equal to j of x prime r, which again we just call j of x prime. So that's again just showing that j of x and j of x prime are the same. So by induction, because now the rest of the path has fewer segments, by induction we get that j of x prime uh, is equal to j of y, and we're done, right? So we have j of x equals j of x prime equals j of y. Um, and so just by using the path and this definition of this function, we see that um, two points that are connected by a path also have the same j value. I apologize, there's a lot of text all at once here, but um, here's the idea. Uh, we want to get the other direction now. So that is, if we have two points, 
where j of x is equal to j of y, then they actually are path connected. And here's where we're really going to have to use facts about polygons and the plane. What we'll do is we'll do induction on the number of crossings in this line segment that goes straight from x to y. Now, if there were no crossings between x and y, the base case of zero crossings, then that's the path. That would be the polygonal path. We'd be all done. Everything would be fine. We'd, we'd show their path connected by just taking the path, which was a single line segment. <clears throat> but in general, that might not happen. It might be that as I go from x straight to y, I hit the edge. And so what I do is I stop right before I hit the edge. And here now, remember, we can walk along the polygon, the edge of the polygon. And let's just walk all the way around until we get to a point x prime. X prime was the first crossing in, of the line segment x, y uh, with the polygon. First crossing after, actually, I guess it's the second crossing. Right? This obviously was the first. Okay. Now, <clears throat> so what do we know? This, uh, we have a path, but we don't know um, really what side of the, of the polygon we're on here. We, we have to actually use some other math to prove that this is true, and I'll show you what I mean. We know because we've constructed a path to, from x to x prime that j of x has to equal j of x prime. So uh, j of x prime is also equal to j of y. That was our main assumption. And so the line segment from x prime to y has fewer crossings. Now, uh, because we don't have this first crossing, right? We got all the way to the next one. So it has fewer crossings. So by induction, there's a path now from x prime to y. Right, there's a, an x prime y path. Let's call it p1. We, the first path we built, we called it, that was, well, we give it a name, that was p0. And by induction, we can get from x prime to y. And so p0 plus p1 is exactly an x y path. So if you notice really this first part, it's, it allowed us to say that as we kind of walk all around the edge and get to a point where we have fewer crossings on the line segment right between us, that we ended up keeping the parity, that is the, whether the number of crossings was odd or even here, um, stayed the same. So, um, um, and so that, that was really the key. All right, so um, this was... Um, kind of a whirlwind. Oh, I left out one of the blanks here. Sorry. There is even number. All right. So I'll leave this up for just a second here. You could think about it, ponder it, try to reconstruct this proof. And you may see other variations of this in some textbooks where they try to only keep the rays horizontal so they don't have to think about sweeping rotationally and just sweeping uh, vertically. But I think this one is kind of clean. So the punchline is that you can take a polygon, you can embed it in the plane, linear embedding in the plane, so the line is made up of straight line segments, and it has an inside and an outside, and um, those inside and outside are path-connected components of the plane minus the polygon. All right, and we're going to think about this notion of kind of removing all the points that were hit by the embedding. We remove them from the plane and see what's left, and those, remember, are called the faces of the graph, or places, faces of the embedding of the graph. And we'll use those in, um, in talking about um, planar graphs and other classes of graphs.